webinar, and I'm going to try to just wrap things up, tying together some of the themes I think you heard earlier. Obviously, my perspective is very much informed by being involved in the launch of the Massachusetts Health Connector back in 2006, so I'm feeling like I'm, it's deja vu all over again with the run-up here to the, the key deadline of uh, October 1st and trying to help um, both states and, um, and private sector partners get ready um, to meet that deadline um, and all the anxiety that that induces. Um, the, uh, my focus, as Catherine said, will be more the status of the, um, the state exchanges as opposed to um, what's going on at the federal level, since you heard from the CSIO folks earlier. Um, but I will draw on a few broader themes um, as well. And really, just kind of my overall focus is how do we make this a success? Um, that's very much something that I was committed to, um, along with a great team in Massachusetts. And I feel like there are a number of people across the country who want to um, make this um, Affordable Care Act a success as well, um, and I, I'm very much committed to that. So I want to just draw quickly on a few of the kind of lessons learned from the studies we did of what our consumers wanted in Massachusetts, and then segue into kind of how that links to where we are with um, our implementation of um, actual state-based exchanges at this moment. Um, I think in terms of trying to make an, a success, um, it can, you know, it's, it might be hard to believe, but it can be um, easy to actually lose focus on the consumer because as much as they're the ones we're trying to serve, when you get into the real brass tacks of operational, um, you know, readiness and things like that, getting the IT stuff going um, and, and all the kind of lift that is when the exchanges are working with their carrier partners on lots of the logistics, um, you, can, you can actually um, sometimes start to lose sight of who that person is you're ultimately trying to serve, as ironic as that may seem. So my, my uh, you know, big lesson learned for us is always be keeping the consumer in mind. There's a lot of people you're trying to keep happy as you get ready for Go Live and in that initial phase. But, and the consumer, um, you know, um, they're, they're all out there. They're spread out. There's lots of different segments of them, and they don't necessarily have a collective voice. And so trying to keep track of what their needs are and really meet them is a, is a very important part of making this all work and getting to the ultimate success of really reducing the number of uninsured folks. And, of course, what consumers want is affordable health plans. They want to see that first and foremost in an exchange, um, and they want the exchange to make it easy for them to research and buy those plans, and they want the exchange to be really um, objective and a good, strong, kind of trusted advisor, a source for that insurance information. Those are the top three things we saw our customers say over and over they wanted. Um, and when they're shopping, they need choice, but they don't want to be overwhelmed by it. That is um, a critical piece of all of this. And so really trying to keep things simple um, is another big theme, and I think it's great news um, that the federal government has took a hard look at the application form and has tried to find a way to shorten it and simplify it wherever possible. Um, and I think that we always have to keep holding ourselves to that standard and looking for ways to improve upon that, take early learnings, and make adjustments as you can all along the way, again, to try and ensure success, to not um, turn people away you know, through, you know, by making things onerous, trying to keep things simple, really, really important thing because this is complicated. Um, and certainly outreach, I can't say enough about how important that is, and a very broad-based outreach. We were fortunate in Massachusetts to have um, the resources at the time to do that. I think the uh, state-based exchanges are probably in a, a little better position at this point when you look at the dollars they've got um, to, to work toward doing the outreach campaign. That said, you can't do it just with public sector dollars alone, and there really has to be a partnership across the sectors, um, and hopefully, um, you know, with some strong help and support from the insurance carriers who will be um, helping out with the exchange uh, launch, but also you know, doing outreach for not only their own health plan, but also just for getting the greater message out and, and um, working closely with the folks um, on the public sector side. I think that's incredibly important, and there's just lots of different pockets of folks you've got to um, you've got to make um, you know, informed, and they they need to hear it from a lot of different sources. So, you know, a, a very broad-based um, outreach campaign is critical to the success of this because, as we know, um, many people still haven't heard about this. Um, and, you know, just to kind of underscore the point that people are looking for affordability, we found consistently um, in our program in Massachusetts these numbers always bore out, you know, month after month. 
that when we looked at the folks who had no subsidy um, and what they chose to buy, they predominantly were buying bronze plans, or if they were a young adult, they would buy the young adult plan or the YAP plan here. That always added up to be you know, well over half of what we sold was at that level. And within those tiers, they were buying the more affordable products because there was a range of, of choice even within the metal tiers price points. And um, you know, folks are very price sensitive. Um, so pushing ourselves as we get through plan selection and um, mounting all of this on the exchange, we've got to keep that in mind um, wherever we can um, to try and get that pricing, um, to get it right, but to frankly be, um, be as aggressive as possible to, uh, to get to the, the, the lowest possible price point for folks. Um, kind of switching gears then to look at where we are, um, I think the folks from CSIO gave us a nice table of um, the status of state exchange decisions. I always like looking at the Kaiser map, and this uh, map has now been consistent for a little while. I would just note that the, um, the, the states that are colored for planning for partnership don't um, include the ones that were on the letter of intent, um, I guess filed the letter of intent. So that would add another seven states into the partnership category. Um, but in terms of those that have declared the state-based exchange, um, that's been a pretty solid list at this point and that's um, 18 of those states, and, um, and including D.C. Um, and so <clears throat> those states, of course, are at a varying degree of readiness, which has already been, been talked about, um, but they, are, you know, they have made the commitment to building their own exchange, and if they don't make it over the finish line for this year, I would imagine they'll, they'll be there for, for 2015. Um, so this is now, now, I think, pretty set. Um, what the states who have chosen to be a state-based exchange have on their plate, and some of this is still evolving, is that they have a lot of design choices. And so how they've, if they've made those choices, um, and it sounds like, for example, with Minnesota, they made the choice to be an open market model um, in 2014, and then they'll segue over to being active purchaser in 2015. Um, that really, you know, is a, an important decision that, that clearly impacts, you know, how many competitors there will be on the exchange. Um, and, you know, my view is that uh, within reason, the more competitors, the better, because you are trying to drive to that affordable price point, giving consumers a good, healthy amount of choice. And um, but that's something that, you know, I think that most of the, um, the states, and certainly the federal exchange folks have said, let's, let's have this be as open of a market as possible um, to, to generate that competition. We don't want to close the door. Um, that said, there are some interesting tools you can use if you choose to be more of an active purchaser state to try and encourage um, the, the carriers to come forward with, with products and prices that are um, perhaps more advantageous for the consumer. So I think it's interesting. We'll see a lot of the open market results soon. Um, and then I think some of these states that want to be uh, more actively um, engaged will, will push back and, and try and fine-tune things once they see kind of where consumers shake out and what's working, what's not working. We certainly experienced that in Massachusetts. We went very broad in the beginning and then started to tailor things a little more in the following years. Um, there are a number of other kinds of, of choices that, that states have to make um, and, you know, whether they require the insurers to offer in both the individual market and the shop exchange um, also can affect the competitive environment. Um, I think, you know, most people are realizing that for the very initial launch of the um, exchanges, there's a huge emphasis on getting the individual side um, up and running and getting that really done right because that's where the predominant focus of getting the uninsured in the door is. And, um, you know, and then the shop exchange and all the kind of opportunities there, bells and whistles, um, while they are important, I think they, they take a little bit of a second priority, frankly, to getting the individual stuff um, launched and working smoothly. Um, certainly, um, there are a number of other choices that states have. I think it's interesting when you look at, um, I'll, I'll move down to the Medicaid plan. There are some states that have decided to require some of the Medicaid managed care organizations to offer plans on the exchange to try and deal with some issues that are anticipated around churn and things like that. Um, we've used the term active purchaser and um, open market model so just to kind of show uh, the, the tally of where states are at this point. The majority of the state-based exchanges have chosen to be open market model um, and it just handful are active purchasers. Um, so as I say, Minnesota 
um, starting out with open market um, sounds like they'll move to active purchaser uh, later, and um, you know that may be the direction some other states go remains to be seen. Um, <clears throat> so in any case, um, and there's a couple of states that haven't yet decided what they're what they're going to do. Um, when we take a step back and look at who's going to use the public exchange, um, certainly the vast majority will be subsidized, and uh, it sounds. You know, 80% was the estimate um, at this point in time, and I heard um, earlier on the webinar that maybe 90%, if you kind of include all the uninsured and you bucket the folks who also will um, go off to the Medicaid program. Anyway, it's a very high number of folks who will be applying for um, insurance coverage who will receive some form of subsidy or another, um, and that's a really key thing to stay focused on um, as well. Because as we look at, and I think this was mentioned, the, the Kaiser um, recent Kaiser poll that was just released, that you know, the, uh, almost half of the general public is actually unaware that the ACA is actually is, is the law. And if you uh, you look at how that breaks out, and you add these two together, 20% of folks think this law was either repealed or um, overturned by the Supreme Court. So there's a, a real kind of knowledge gap there. And um, when you drill down into some of the, the data and, and um, the surveys that have been done, it tends to be um, that the, the folks who stand to benefit the most from this law, so the, the uninsured and particularly the low-income uninsured, um, are the ones who actually know the least about the um, status of this law and what its benefits will be. So there's a huge um, kind of opportunity you can look at it um, in terms of what outreach and education can do um, for the general public and specifically those who will benefit. Um, once folks do come in the door, I think there's, you know, folks have become aware that there's a significant um, challenge around managing churn. So just because you get folks in the door doesn't mean they're going to stay in the program that they originally qualified for, and there will be a lot of activity that the exchange has to do once they've enrolled folks to kind of keep track and help them stay in the appropriate um, level of coverage and make sure that there aren't any surprises in terms of, of what they owe. Um, so I, you know, that's that's something that's gotten some publicity. Something that we experienced um, that I would bucket as additional challenges once people are in the door um, is enrollee churn in the unsubsidized population. And while this won't be a majority of of the folks who use the exchange, it's still kind of interesting to note that even those folks who can afford the insurance don't need a subsidy. If they are currently uninsured, they they tend to be folks who are kind of in and out of jobs that offer employer-sponsored insurance. So they're not kind of the permanently uninsured. Um, they churn a lot as well. They just don't get the same attention because they don't need a subsidy. But they, but there is um, there is turnover with this population, and so that's just another kind of aspect that has to be managed. Um, it's also as as we're thinking back to enrollment, um, converting people online is actually not not so easy. People don't necessarily. Um, if they shop on the exchange, if they don't need a subsidy, they may not buy on the exchange. Um, and they often need some additional support to make their decision. That means the call center. It's not just kind of a one-stop, clean and done online purchase. Um, there's, there's multiple visits that are being made and resources that folks need to, to make that kind of big purchase decision. Um, so the exchange, which obviously has to run like a business, needs to um, capture these, these customers and, you know, um, get them in and get you know get them in as members, and we found that to be something that we constantly needed to kind of uh, strategize about what's the best way to approach that again from a segment that does not need a subsidy and therefore doesn't have to buy through the exchange. Um, and the churn I mentioned earlier in Rolly of the unsubsidized population, when we took a snapshot and look at that at the connector, it's actually quite high. There were only 55% um, of subscribers remaining after a 12-month period. Um, in terms of looking at the overall outcomes, that was one of the things I was asked to do. It's hard to exactly predict um, where we're going to end up, and certainly there will be significant variations by state. I think the initial projections had been that um, by the end of the implementation of health reform, we'd have upwards of 93% of the U.S. population insured. In Massachusetts, we didn't have as much of a gap to close. Um, we, we didn't have as many uninsured to begin with, in other words. Um, and we've got about 97% of our state insured. Um, I think it's going to be tough to get to the 93% in the U.S. Obviously, um, states have choice about Medicaid expansion. So regardless of how well we launch exchanges and everything we do, 
a really key piece of this is where we end up with the Medicaid program. Um, we've, uh, we've talked some about, uh, I think earlier, uh, uh, Scott talked about the um, premiums that uh, we expect all prices to go up for many of the consumers. In Massachusetts, we actually had a different situation because of our marketplace already being guaranteed issue. We had the relative luxury in the fact that when we launched reform, individual market premiums went down for folks and we had a good news story. Um, the fact that that's not going to be true in a lot of the states, I think, brings an extra challenge to the outreach um, efforts to roll out of this and, and the, and the take-up of insurance. Um, so I will just note that when we look at uh, Medicaid expansion, which again is a really important piece of this whole puzzle, um, we see kind of a correlation between the states that are choosing to build their own exchange or be partnership exchanges. They are also the states that are much more likely to be supporting Medicaid expansion, at least as of right now. So that's where we're going to see the big coverage gains, obviously, um, you know, in large measure because of that Medicaid expansion going on in conjunction with it, this kind of active state exchange um, development. So I'm not going to hazard a guess as to exactly where we're going to end up. I'm going to go with just the CBO numbers for now. Um, and their most recent estimate is that the, um, after several years of rollout, we'll see a decrease in the number of uninsured by about 27 million. Um, 26 million of those folks should be enrolled for exchanges. I do think that these estimates are going to continue to be refined as we, as we really embrace the reality of, of um, how this launch goes, which is going to have its bumps, and it's certainly going to um, be a challenge to do the sufficient amount of outreach that we're going to need to do to close that gap in terms of what people know today and, um, and what the exchange brings to offer them. So, you know, three years out, I, I hope we're going to see that many people enrolled in exchanges, um, but I don't think there's any guarantees it's going to take an absolute, you know, all-out effort to make this a success. And, you know, again, we focused on exchanges during today's conversation, but a really important decision is the Medicaid expansion decision, and it really swings the numbers by about 10 million, whether states, um, in terms of reducing the total number of uninsured if states choose to do this, all versus nothing, Kaiser kind of put out a report that, that um, makes some estimates as to where we'll end up. And um, I think that, that kind of sums it up in terms of coverage projection. Um, huge variable here is where we go with Medicaid. So I'm going to leave it there because I think we want to leave some time for Q&A. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Catherine.